So when I was at the Media Lab, as well as the scientists inventing the future of vision, there are also some extraordinary people inventing whole new cultural forces, the future of music. Our next speaker has been involved in all sorts of things, many of which have probably touched your lives if you've played Guitar Hero, for instance. He's invented new musical instruments. He's also reinventing the idea of what a symphony is. Please welcome, from the Media Lab, Todd Macover. <laughs> Thanks so much, David. So we're going to go from that incredible music demo by Imogen Heap to visual science back to music. Uh, could I have my slides? There we go. So I'm Todd, and I have uh, devoted most of my life to music and to thinking how music can transform us as deeply as possible and also can reach as many people as possible and uh, make it possible so that people can actively participate in music. So I started out, um, I, I came to this kind of naturally. My dad is one of the people who started the field of computer graphics. And my mom is a pianist and uh, creative music teacher. So I sort of got the technology and uh, music growing up. Um, I started out sort of as a, as a normal cellist, playing Bach and things like that. Started to twist my cello when I was in high school. And then uh, when I was in college, started to really twist it. So like Imogen, I got very interested in making uh, tracking devices for hands and playing cello with things like that. So I was really lucky uh, to find the Media Lab because it's been the perfect place for me to do a lot of this work. Uh, you can find out about the Media Lab in the current issue of Wired, of course. And as David said, one of the things that's not so well known about the Media Lab is that besides all the science being done there, there's an incredible collection of people who are really thinking about expression, arts, and design from very out-of-the-box ways. And because it's not a traditional art center, People like Neri Oxman and Sepp Kamvar and Joe Paradiso and Leah Beakley and many, many others who you'll see in that issue are crossing boundaries where you can't really say, are they an artist or an engineer or an architect or exactly what? So it's been a great place to be. And it's meant that over the years, I've pushed music in ways uh, that in one career are kind of unlikely. So uh, music and kids and music and opera and music and robots and music and health. And I just wanted to give you a little glimpse of how some of that weaving story went and what some of the central ideas are. So very much uh, like what Imogen is working on, so I won't go into this too much, I have been interested in how to take traditional instruments and the idea of being a performer and to push that as far as possible. Um, so we make instruments called hyper instruments, again, very much like what Imogen is doing. Uh, this is Yo-Yo Ma in one of our classic projects. The idea is to measure what a performer like this is doing so that the instrument knows not just what's being played, but how it's being played. So the emotion of the performance can completely transform the instrument. Um, this is, I'll play you just two seconds. This is a young uh, English cellist named Peter Gregson and uh, a light display by uh, United Visual Artists, also here from London. And Peter's playing a normal cello with a special bow with all kinds of sensors in it. And the way he plays the bow takes the actual cello playing and shatters it and turns it into all this music and also controls all of these lights. Uh, but I wanted to show you the latest, which is a little different. Uh, in my most recent opera, which is called Death and the Powers, it's an opera with a bunch of robots. Uh, it's actually a story. Uh, we did this for Monaco. Doing an opera about robots for Prince Albert in the Monaco Opera House was about the strangest thing I've ever done. But it was pretty, it's worth it. You should give it a try. Um, the opera's about a guy in his late 60s, rich, powerful, successful, a little creepy. We think of him kind of like Bill Gates meets Walt Disney meets Howard Hughes, somebody like that people we all know. And um, he wants to live forever. And so he uses all of his smarts and all of his money to figure out a way to download himself into his environment. And actually, when the opera starts, he's about to turn on the switch for the system so that he can disappear. But everything about himself, his memories, his personality, his way of relating to all his loved ones, even manipulating his businesses, stay in the world. And so the opera is really about how can, what about of us as humans can be translated into some other form. And do we want that to happen? So he leaves the stage, and there's a chorus of robots. There are 12 robots on stage, uh, which don't look like humans, but have many, many human characteristics. Um, they're kind of his surrogates once he leaves. There's a giant chandelier, which looks like a lighting chandelier, but actually vibrates with his voice. And there's actually a very sexy love scene with his wife tangled up in this chandelier. She actually likes him better when he's gone, as, as in the chandelier for some reason. Um, so she plays with his voice in the chandelier. 
Um, and the whole stage itself, all the walls, his library come alive uh, with his spirit. And they move, they're big robots also, and they show the kind of uh, intensity of his, of his inner life, sometimes just in pure light. To do all this, uh, since the uh, performer is off stage, he turns on the system and he leaves. He goes down with the orchestra. You never see him again until the very end. Uh, we had to measure what he was doing in a different way. So we, uh, that's actually Ellie Jessup, the person uh, Imogen talked about who worked on the gloves. And Ellie is a specialist in measuring gesture, what gesture means, and turning it into something interesting. So with Ellie and a couple of other people, uh, we took the baritone, James Maddalena, um, measured his arm gesture, his voice, of course, looked at his facial expressions, measured his muscle tension, what's called galvanic skin response, which is how relaxed or tense he was, and also his breathing. So a variety of things which he was conscious of, but many things that he wasn't. And all of these went into a comprehensive system which can tell what his emotions are at any one moment and how they change over the course of the piece. In fact, we have a new language called media scores where we can script out the emotional change that a character might take, and that can then get reflected in the music, in the lighting, in the story, in the robots, in everything all at the same time. So this is just a little uh, minute fragment from the opera so you can get a sense of what it looks and sounds like and how this uh, world on stage comes alive by measuring a performer off stage. No! I have billions of pucks and I can still sign checks. Robots get the, back, uh, the, the last word after this big scene where the father tries to bring his daughter to join him in the system. She refuses and stays as a big climax, like in a good opera. And the robots come back and say, that's it? That's the show? I don't get it, because they don't understand death. They don't understand what the people are doing. So they have to put on the show again next year. That's why it keeps getting performed. Um, so anyway, do projects like that to put, push performance as far forward as possible. But I've been equally interested in how to get all of you, how to get audiences, people who love music but aren't necessarily up there on stage, as involved in a musical process as possible, as much as anybody else. So very interested in creative collaboration. This has taken a lot of forms. Uh, we make instruments designed not for um, you know, a guitarist or whatever, but for anybody to play. This is a whole uh, orchestra called the Brain Opera, including a chair that measures the electricity in your body. That's Bono sitting on it. He's played it. A lot of people have tried this. Um, we make instruments for kids. We call them music toys, squeezy or rhythm instruments, a whole series. Uh, software that uses lines and colors. This is called Hyperscore that lets anybody compose pretty sophisticated music just with lines. Um, it's designed for real musicians to play. So you draw these things, push a button, and then it prints out notes for an orchestra or a piano or a rock band or whatever. So um, it's, it's really helpful for composing. And uh, it's true, as David said, that out of all this kind of work, um, all of the, it's funny, because everything for Rock Band and Guitar Hero came out of the work we did for Yo-Yo Ma on the cello, the measurement of physical behavior while you're playing an instrument, analyzing that behavior, taking a piece of music and putting it in a form so that if you win a game or lose a game or do more or less intense, the music changes. Uh, so the software and the hardware all came out of that and um, anyway, it was invented by students right down the block. 
I'm working on a project right now which is an attempt to pull these two strains, you know, the high-end music making and involving everybody together. And it's keeping me up every single night. It's probably the hardest thing I've done. Um, I was asked by the, the Toronto Symphony Orchestra to write a new piece for orchestra. And I told them that that would interest me if I could invite the entire city of Toronto to write it with me. So that's what we're doing. We started this uh, before the summer. We're right in the middle of it. And uh, the piece, we're doing a big festival in March where this will be played. So how are we doing this? I started out with a picture, a kind of shape, a score of the piece, which is purely visual. Uh, it shows the contours. You can uh, zoom into it at different levels, and it'll show you the texture, the rhythm, how different things add up. Uh, you can click on things and hear what things sound like as they develop. And it also says who contributes what in the piece. There are certain things that I ask the community to send to me. There are certain things I send out to the community for people to modify and change and send back. And there are certain things that we make together in a variety of ways. Uh, there's a website that explains all this, a, a pretty good blog uh, that people follow. So I do things like work with musicians all over Toronto. Uh, these are actually musicians from the Toronto Symphony Orchestra. I started with them. I made a kind of chord progression, which is like a personality, uh, uh, a narrative of the piece. And uh, I, I sent the chord progression out to you know, the 100 musicians in the orchestra and said, if you want to hack this, I'd love to have you do it. Add other chords, change my chords, write melodies around my chords. So surprisingly, orchestras are wonderful. That's why I like to do this. But they're also usually very passive. Um, but about 75% of the orchestra sent me back their hack of my, uh, my chords. I took that and wrote it into different versions, different sketches of a piece. We went back and forth. And it turned into a kind of what I call launch music, the original music that's at the core of the piece. And some of the music is designed. Some of it's written out very precisely. Some of it's designed so that I give chords or rhythms to the musicians. And when we're together, we can change on the fly how the music is elaborated, depending on, for instance, if I conduct it, my gestures, or how they uh, work with each other. I'm also working with a bunch of young musicians. Uh, these are, uh, this is the youth orchestra in Toronto. And I'm doing different things with them. So for instance, I was up there uh, last week, and I took sounds that were recorded around Toronto. So for instance, I took this sound. Those of you who have been to Toronto know that it's on a lake, and there are beaches right in the center of the city. It's amazing. So that was Cherry Beach. And um, we had an hour together, and I said, OK, can we take that recording and turn it into, let's throw out the recording and turn it into something purely acoustic that you can play on your instruments. And you're like, oh my god, I don't know. So we tried, and uh, after about an hour, um, this is the orchestra, these young musicians playing the beach without any electronics at all, just with strings and winds and brass instruments. A few too many seagulls, maybe, but other than that, uh, it's not bad, actually. So we can do an experiment like that. Then I can again notate it, send it back to the orchestra, and that becomes part of the fragment that is uh, of this piece that I'm making. But I'm doing this, it turns out, we're doing a lot of this online. But we're doing a lot of it. We talked a lot in this last day or so about what is appropriate to do online and what works better with just human beings one to one, in this case, one to thousands. So I go up to Toronto all the time, and I work with instrument makers and people in different ethnic communities, street musicians, indie musicians, kids studying hip hop. I mean, it, unbelievable different groups. Each group, I've had to found, find a different way that something that interests me might interest them, or vice versa. So it's like multiple different projects we're doing at the same time. We're also asking people all around town, oh, this is an example. I can send out my music, and they can vary it in a variety of apps. They can change it, stretch it, uh, decide what parts of it they like best, and send it back. We send out requests for people to record the city of Toronto, favorite sounds, sounds they hate, most typical sounds. We have thousands and thousands of sounds in a database. We analyze all these sounds automatically according to different criteria, which allows me to analyze them, but also to send them back out to the community. And next week, uh, we're um, uh, launching an app that lets people draw with these sounds, both real sounds from the city and acoustic sounds, and mix back in between so that they can shape online and trade with each other parts of the piece. Then when we play these things back, everything together, uh, there's, there's a new kind of score where you can visualize that. And I thought I'd just play you um, a little bit of where we are now. You'll see a little explanation. You'll hear a little bit of me with the orchestra. And you'll hear a little bit of sounds from the city mixed in uh, with the orchestra music. 
And I'm actually using my cello at the end as a kind of hyper cello where I mix these sounds live. So this is just a minute or so to give you a little sense of what the piece is starting to sound like. Toronto is one of the most international cities in the world. It has every idea, every kind of person, every nationality, every sound that you can imagine. I'm Todd Macover, along with my colleagues at the Toronto Symphony. We're doing something pretty unusual. We're going to make a new symphony. We're inviting everybody in the city of Toronto to collaborate with me over the coming months to shape this symphony, to make the music, and to create it together. I've started off this process by imagining a kind of shape and picture of a Toronto symphony. Toronto in March. We'll see what that turns into. <laughs> just have a few minutes. Let me just give you one more category, and then I'll then I'll uh, stop. Uh, there is a pretty good website where you can follow this and see what's emerging. So we've got different things happening on stage. Audience is hopefully becoming part of the creative process, and I think what's so interesting is how with technology and all the arts we can totally. Um, control and connect all of our senses in what we're, what, we're, what we're building now. And we do this in many different ways. Um, we do a lot of work with music and health because music is, touches us so deeply that uh, I don't have time to explain this today, but I, I did do a TED talk in this area, if you want to look it up. Um, how music can allow people like Dan Elsie, who has cerebral palsy, to communicate in ways that he could never do any other ways. We just launched a series of apps that detect Alzheimer's disease earlier than any other uh, clinical technique. There are many, many ways that music can influence our, our health. And um, just uh, actually last week we officially launched this project called Vocal Vibrations where I'm extremely interested in setting up environments where we can encourage people to use their voices to sing both for pleasure, to connect with other people, but also to be aware of the vibration your voice makes when you sing and literally to amplify your voice and your vibration in your own body, to magnify the effect of singing uh, for mental concentration, and we believe for physical well-being. So we showed the first uh, experiments. Actually, Ellie Jessup, the glove person, is working on this as well. Um, we showed this last week um, to the Dalai Lama, who was at MIT, and um, he tried it out. He, he vibrates very well, I've got to say. He uh, shows a lot of promise. So next time I come back here, uh, we're actually uh, hoping to launch this a year from now, uh, first in Paris and then other places. Um, Talk about multi-sensory. Um, it turns out a bunch of my students right now are very, very interested in music, smell, and food in particular. Uh, very resonant with our discussions yesterday. Uh, but the idea that listening to music might influence the way that we taste, um, and not surprisingly, all of our senses uh, contradict, juxtapose, and reinforce each other. So we're doing things like uh, augmenting experiences by using music and food, but also completely controverting them. So Janice Wang, who's one of my current students, um, does all kinds. This is a, a, a roller coaster built in our freight elevator with food tasting um, that's meant to really mess with your head about what you're tasting, what the texture is, and uh, what, what the experience is. So this is likely to grow. And um, one tiny video, which is about this immersive experience. How many of you know Punch Drunk? Most of you should. It's the most wonderful London-based theater group uh, right here in East London. Um, they have a big hit show in New York right now called Sleep No More. 
uh, which involves, it's based on Macbeth and uh, Alfred Hitchcock's movie Rebecca. It involves um, the public wearing masks, walking around 150 rooms in a gigantic warehouse in Chelsea in New York. Actors moving in and out of spaces, sometimes you see them, sometimes you don't. Everybody has a different experience. So already, it totally breaks down boundaries between who are the performers and who's the audience. Punch Drunk came to us a year ago to say, would it be possible to give people distributed around the world online this same immersive experience and make something really magical happen between physical people having this experience and anybody else? So I don't have time to go into it in detail, but we did work on this. We launched it last summer. Uh, we made an experience where an online uh, a, a, a audience member in New York connects to an online audience member, and the two of them go through this experience together, uh, and they both have an experience that neither could have alone. So um, we measure all kinds of things about the audience member live in the space. Um, we actually build uh, special masks. They get the same mask, but this one measures your heartbeat and your um, tension level, has little loud uh, speakers uh, connected to your bones so you can be whispered to. Uh, so your emotional state gets sent out online. Similar thing happens from the online player. Um, the, ma the masks aren't that comfortable to wear, but they work. Um, but there are all kinds of connections. So online, I find about what the person is experiencing. I can send things from online to the physical space in New York. So I can type a message on my computer, and it gets typed on a real old-fashioned typewriter that's, that's got mechanisms in it. So it types with nobody there and types a message on real paper that somebody wants to send you. Um, there are things like we this Ouija board, which uh, I can type a message, and the Ouija board uh, acts it out live in a space, if you find that. Um, and uh, really have very little time, but I wanted to give you just a little sense, this is like 20 seconds, of what it feels like to be in this experience connected online to a live space in New York. Oops, just to say, it was interesting, uh, the reviewers simultaneously went through the experience in London and New York and wrote about it together. They partnered to go through it, um, and a lot of people in different places have been covering it. Anyway, here's a little bit. <laughs> Hopefully that'll be scaled. Um, to finish, I just wanted to say that um, you know, if you look in the lexicon, there are six arts, these arts that have been listed for the last 2,000 years. Exactly 100 years ago, they added the seventh art. So if you, how many arts are there? There's seven. Cinema is the seventh art. And I think that what's so exciting right now is that all the art forms, all the forms of expression are bursting out of their seams. And so we're sort of thinking that maybe it's time to think about what happens when we put together the next big art form that really combines every way that we know how to express ourselves. What happens when we combine all the different art forms with all the senses, do something which is massively collaborative and creative, not just for the, 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 the normal creators, but for everybody involved, and that merges art forms with health and science and with life itself. So that's what I'm gonna be working on for the next years. Thanks very much. <laughs> <laughs>